If you become the department head, everyone will quit. The office fell silent at Miles's loud outburst. With a smug look on his face, Miles threw his resignation letter onto my desk. Following his lead, the employees standing behind him started tossing their resignation letters one by one, 20 in total. But the moment they heard my words, they all widened their eyes in shock. Thank goodness. This is such a relief. What? Miles's face went blank as he stood there, mouth agape. I slowly looked around at their faces, a calm smile forming on mine. There comes a time in life when you have to figure out what truly matters. Sometimes it's harsh, and it might even lead you down the wrong path, but in the end, it's all up to your own choices. My name is Kieran. I'm a 36-year-old employee working at a small company in the city. Up until now, my life hasn't been particularly eventful, just the usual. I went through high school, then college, and landed a job like everyone else. After getting a few job offers, I ended up choosing my current company based on the salary and the nature of the work. Nothing special. I work in sales and have no particular complaints, just doing my best wherever the company places me. But now, for the first time, I'm faced with a life-changing decision that has left me truly puzzled. And the reason for that is Miles, my co-worker, six years younger than me. Miles just turned 30 and takes pride in being a graduate of a prestigious university in the city. He's at his peak in terms of learning the ins and outs of the job. As a mid-level employee, he's expected to lead the younger staff, and the company has given him significant responsibilities over the years, hoping for his growth. But that might have inflated his ego beyond reason. Before anyone realized it, Miles had become the kind of troublesome employee who constantly complained about the company. With my skills, I should be making more money. But instead, I barely get any raises, not enough vacation days, and I'm stuck doing boring work. These complaints would come straight to me, his direct supervisor, and I couldn't help but feel annoyed at his sense of entitlement. Though Miles worked hard in his own way, his enthusiasm often backfired, leading to occasional successes but also frequent blunders that erased all his progress. He seemed to think of himself as an elite, but one out of every three times, he caused some sort of problem. Even though he should have known the standard procedures, he kept adding his own twist to them, which often confused our clients. More than once, he added terms to a contract without prior discussion, telling the client, this is the better option. You should definitely try it. And each time, it fell on me, his supervisor, to clean up the mess. Miles, I understand your enthusiasm and that you wanted to do something good for the client. But you can't just change the terms without consulting them first. Well, I can't help it if I get a flash of inspiration. I guess someone like me, an elite, can't expect someone like you, just an average employee, to understand. No matter how much I warned him, Miles would just brush it off seemingly convinced that I was simply jealous of his elite status. Had he been more humble, I might have been able to correct his misguided behavior, but that was too much to hope for. His pride in his prestigious university background had grown so large that he couldn't build good relationships with the other employees. Miles became the leader of a group of co-workers from the same university, where they regularly vented about the company. At the same time, he began to look down on anyone he perceived as having a lesser education, even if they were his seniors. Naturally, Miles and his group became disliked by the rest of the staff, but none of them left the company. Our company was always short-staffed, and even troublesome employees were seen as a necessary evil. Still, despite his cocky attitude, Miles was only 30 and part of me still hoped he would grow and mature. That's why, as his manager, I continued to guide him with patience. 
As time went on, the younger employees started gaining more skills and soon surpassed Miles in their number of deals. That's when Miles began making snide remarks, as if trying to cut down the younger staff who were standing out more than him. I'm always stuck with the tough projects, while the younger guys get the easy jobs. It's so unfair. He began openly complaining, and the workplace atmosphere kept deteriorating. Even though we were short-staffed, other employees started voicing concerns that it was becoming difficult to work with Miles around. And soon the office started treating him as a problem. At the time, I was the department manager, responsible for handling the complaints from my team, so I did my best to manage the situation. Setting up meetings with Miles whenever an issue arose. But Miles never seemed to think he was in the wrong. Even when I gave him firm feedback, he would calmly respond, if you dislike me that much, I can quit any time. I've got friends from college who are starting a new company and want me to join as a co-founder. Though I wasn't about to stop him if he really wanted to quit, Miles just laughed it off, never taking my warnings seriously. I'm fine with quitting, you know. But without me, this company won't function. Miles declared, clearly waiting for me to stop him. And since it was true that losing him would be problematic, it gave me a headache just thinking about it. Our company was severely understaffed, and new recruits were hard to come by. So even an employee like Miles was considered better than no one at all. We were hiring anyone who applied, but the burden of training them slowed things down even more, creating a vicious cycle. Miles was well aware of this situation, which is probably why he knew I couldn't push back too hard. As I, and the rest of the company, wondered how to handle Miles, the inevitable happened. It started when a younger employee landed a new client. This employee had been quiet and unassuming at first, but unlike Miles, he was humble and eager to learn from his seniors. His serious work ethic made him popular with clients, and as a result, he was growing rapidly since joining the company. Finally, he was recognized as the top salesman of the month. We were all proud of his progress and praised him. But the only one who wasn't happy about it was Miles. He only got that job because of favoritism from a longtime client. If I had been in his position, I would have tripled the profits. Miles muttered to himself, grumbling alone. It would have been fine if that's all he did, but he started criticizing the younger employee under the guise of giving him guidance. However, even though the employee was younger, he had more practical experience on the ground. When the junior politely pointed this out, Miles completely lost his temper. How dare you, a younger employee, talk back to me? You think results alone give you the right to act like this? Miles yelled, and the younger employee could only shrink in fear. I rushed in to break it up, but in the end, the younger employee left the company. Soon after, it became clear from the atmosphere in the company that everyone wished that it had been Miles who quit instead of the talented junior. But Miles, oblivious to his role in all this, was furious, saying, I went out of my way to guide him, and now it looks like I drove him out. If that's how you're going to treat me, I really will quit. Are you okay with that? He demanded, getting in my face. Still, he showed no signs of changing his behavior. With the departure of the promising young employee, I finally realized how serious the situation was. If we kept Miles around, other valuable employees would undoubtedly leave. It was obvious that the company would be better off if Miles quit. But firing someone without a good reason wasn't legally allowed. I was stuck, secretly hoping that Miles would actually resign. Then, one day, the tipping point arrived. It was announced that I had been promoted to department head as part of a company reorganization. As I mentioned before, our company was extremely short-staffed, which was partly why I was able to get promoted in my 30s. 
But this news only seemed to ignite Miles's competitive spirit. If Karen can be promoted to department head, then I should be promoted to manager right now. I started hearing rumors that Miles was complaining about this within his own group. I knew trouble was brewing, and sure enough, the next day, Miles and his group of 20 employees showed up at my desk. What is this all about? Let me get straight to the point. Either promote us or give us a raise now. Miles's loud voice echoed through the office, plunging the room into silence. He glanced around at the quiet room with a smug expression, then arrogantly tossed his resignation letter onto my desk. If you're going to be department head, we're all quitting. Unless, of course, you accept our demands right now. As if on cue, the other employees began throwing their resignation letters at me as well. They must have thought the company couldn't survive without them. I couldn't believe how foolish they were being. I gathered up the 20 resignation letters, feeling confused as I carefully picked them up. Watching me, Miles sneered and mockingly said, You'd be in trouble if we all quit, right? So, what are you going to do? If you're smart enough to be promoted to department head, you should know the answer. You're right. If you all left, it would be a huge problem. And I'd definitely be held accountable for my management skills. At my response, Miles and his group exchanged satisfied smiles, nodding to each other as if they'd won. But the next moment, they were stunned, their eyes wide in disbelief at what I said next. Thank goodness. This is such a relief. What? Miles stood there, dumbfounded, his mouth hanging open in disbelief. I calmly looked at their faces and smiled gently. I'm glad to hear your true feelings. It's unfortunate, but I have to respect your decision. What? Wait, what are you talking about? They clearly hadn't expected me to actually accept their resignation letters. Miles, now pale, rushed toward me in a panic. His frantic behavior caused the group behind him to become uneasy. Everyone began to look worried, whispering anxiously among themselves, their faces clouded with uncertainty. Seeing this, I couldn't help but smile to myself, realizing that my hunch had been right. Miles was the only one openly voicing his dissatisfaction with the company. I had suspected that the rest of the group had just been swept up by his momentum, joining him without much thought. Everyone working here knew how short-staffed we were and how hard it was for the company to let anyone go. They probably thought that if Miles's demands were met, they could get promotions and higher pay without much effort. But there's no such thing as getting what you want without putting in the work. Anyone who worked their way up from the bottom, like me, understood that. But Miles and his group, having never faced any major setbacks, had coasted from elite schools into our company based on name recognition alone. They have been living in a world where their selfishness has always been accepted. So they must have joined Miles's rebellion without thinking it through. Now, faced with the reality that their resignation letters might actually be accepted, they were completely panicked. Behind the pale-faced Miles, I could hear the anxious murmurs of his group. Wait, this can't be real, right? This was just supposed to be a negotiation tactic, right? Isn't this common in other countries? Their confusion made me sigh, a mixture of frustration and disbelief. It's true that negotiating for better pay or working conditions had been done before, but it was always through calm, rational discussions. You'd research beforehand, present valid reasons, and then arrange a meeting with the company to discuss a raise. What they were doing, threatening to quit unless their demands were met, had no precedent in our company. I looked at the panicking employees and at Miles, who stood defiantly in front of them, and decided to give them one last chance to negotiate. If any of you want to take back your resignation, now's the time. 
No one in this company has ever tried this kind of stunt before. That's because there have never been employees as talented as us. Miles, despite his pale complexion, continued with his arrogant claims. But behind him, it was clear his group no longer wanted to stand by him. They were looking down, shifting uneasily. No longer aligned with their leader. I addressed the unsettled group with a gentle tone. Is this really what you want? Are you all resigning because you have genuine grievances with the company? Or are you just following along without thinking? At my words, the other employees clearly showed signs of distress, though Miles continued to glare at me with fiery eyes. After a tense standoff, I let out a small sigh, smiled, and stood up. If you're all so determined, then there's nothing I can do. I'll go ahead and submit your resignation letters. Thank you for your hard work. With that, I turned and headed straight for the president's office. Behind me, I could hear the sounds of a scuffle as some employees tried to chase after me, while others were held back by Miles. I hadn't expected things to go this smoothly. I hurried toward the president's office, trying hard to suppress the laughter that was bubbling up inside me. Firing an employee for company-related reasons is a complicated process. It's difficult to find a justifiable reason for termination, and if things go wrong, it can lead to strained relations or even lawsuits. Even without those risks, there are significant downsides for the company. If it's a company-initiated termination, severance pay increases, and various subsidies can be cut off. The best solution was for Miles to resign voluntarily. But despite his countless threats of, what would you do if I quit? Miles had never actually intended to leave. So, this collective resignation stunt was the opportunity one had been waiting for. When I finally explained the situation to the company's president, Mr. Norris, I kept it brief, outlining only the facts. Mr. Norris, holding the 20 resignation letters in his hand, was visibly sweating. Having 20 people submit their resignation letters all at once? The company won't survive like this. Please wait. I believe what happens next will change things. Mr. Norris looked pale, but after hearing my explanation, he gradually regained his color. By the end, he even smiled as he saw me off. In the end, Miles resigned just as he had said he would. He kept complaining about me and the company until the very last moment. I'll find another job right away, no problem. But I bet the company will be in trouble without me, right? You're right. Losing all 20 of you would definitely hurt. When I gave him my honest opinion, Miles smirked and continued. I figured as much. But we're not backing down from our demands. Demands? As I tilted my head in confusion, Miles confidently declared. If you want us back, you'll have to meet our demands, either a promotion or a raise. Actually, since we'd be coming back after resigning, you'll have to give us both. Are you sure about this? You're really okay with leaving the company and not regretting it? Despite all the trouble Miles caused, he was still one of my important subordinates. Out of a final sense of consideration, I offered him some advice, but Miles just scoffed at my concern. I understand that you're upset about losing a talented employee like me, but you're the ones who angered us in the first place. Miles said with a smug grin, puffing out his chest. You can call us back once you realize how valuable we are. But don't take too long, or another company might snap us up. With a half laugh, Miles threw out his parting words and walked out of the office. Watching his confident figure disappear, I let out a sigh, equal parts exasperated and resigned. One week later, I called Miles back to the office. When I saw him again, he was dressed in a sharp suit for some reason, 
and his voice brimmed with barely contained excitement as he asked. You finally called. You said you had something to discuss, so what's this about? Oh, I just wanted you to pick up your personal belongings. You left some things behind when you resigned. Miles glanced at the box containing his belongings, but he remained still, not moving. He kept looking at me, as if waiting for something more. I prompted him again, what's the matter? Go ahead and take your things. Um, is that really all you wanted from me? Miles stared at me with a bewildered expression, as if he had been tricked. Yes, that's all. Make sure you get home safely. No, no. What is going on here? Clearly frustrated, Miles hastily rummaged through his belongings, as if expecting something else to be hidden in the box. What? I just didn't want your stuff lying around the office after you left. It needed to be cleared out. That's not what I meant. Isn't there something you need to talk to me about? I thought today was about rehiring me. Seeing Miles approach me in shock, I finally realized he had misunderstood the situation. It seemed Miles believed the company had fallen apart after his resignation. Then I called him back to ask him to return to his old position, or at least, that's what he thought. He must have been so confident that he would be rehired, showing up in a sharp suit. The effort he put into this misunderstanding was almost pitiable. With a firm tone, I told him clearly. No, we're not hiring right now. We don't have any plans to rehire you. How can you say that? If you don't rehire me now, I'm really going to move on to another company. And the other 19 employees will join me too. All I have to do is give the word. Miles's face turned red with frustration as he continued to rant. I realized that he wasn't hearing what I was saying. Though it might be hard for him to accept, it was my responsibility as his former supervisor to tell him the truth. Listen, Miles. The other 19 employees didn't resign. What? Miles froze, his eyes widening in shock. No, no, that can't be right. They all submitted their resignation letters with me. Afterward, they all came back and withdrew their letters. You were the only one who actually resigned. As soon as Miles heard my response, his face flushed with anger. Those guys betrayed me. It's not so much betrayal as it is that they never really intended to quit in the first place. The truth is, right after I submitted the 20 resignation letters to the president a week ago, 19 of the employees, excluding Miles, came running after me. With sweat beating on their foreheads, they all bowed and begged me to return their resignation letters. We're so sorry for causing such a fuss. We were just following Miles's lead, and we never really wanted to quit. Seeing their sincere apologies, I turned right back around and returned to the president's office. Leading the 19 employees, who looked thoroughly ashamed, I asked Mr. Norris to give their resignation letters back. When I explained the situation to Miles, he stomped his feet in frustration, clearly upset. How could they do this to me? But without the most talented person, the company is still in trouble, right? Actually, everyone has been covering your workload just fine. In fact, the team has grown more united, and efficiency has even improved. In truth, Without Miles constantly complaining and underperforming, the workplace had become much livelier. Everyone had been fed up with Miles' endless grumbling, and now the atmosphere was more positive. Employees were helping each other, stepping in to cover any mistakes, and the office had a more cooperative vibe. As the workplace atmosphere improved, so did the productivity of the employees, and work began to flow more smoothly. Now, a week later, sales have actually increased compared to when Miles was still with us. 
Positive changes have also appeared in my own work. The time I used to spend dealing with Miles's issues has now been fully redirected to my actual responsibilities. With my focus back on sales, I managed to land the biggest deal of the past year, and the whole company is in a celebratory mood. On top of that, the new employees I've been training have finally gained enough experience to work independently. They've become valuable contributors, working hard for the company. And to top it off, our active recruitment efforts have paid off, bringing in promising new talent. So, really, there's nothing for you to worry about. You can move on and follow your own path, Miles. What? No. Are you saying there's no place for me to return to? I'm offering to come back, and I'm the best employee. Miles's voice trembled, as if he were on the verge of tears, desperately trying to persuade me. But by now, there was no spot for him at the company. If you're as talented as you say, you'll have no problem finding another job. I'm sure you'll land an even better one soon. Well, but I've worked at this company for so long. I thought I could help out as a veteran employee. Clutching the box of his belongings tightly, Miles stubbornly persisted, refusing to give up. Even as he persisted, I remained silent, and eventually, his patience snapped. Collapsing to the floor, Miles suddenly began to vent his frustrations. I never actually wanted to quit the company. I just wanted better conditions. If that's true, then you completely mishandled the negotiation. Waving around a resignation letter and making demands isn't a sincere way to negotiate. At my remark, Miles finally broke down in tears. Grabbing the hem of my suit, he began making ridiculous excuses. It's your fault, Kieran. As my boss, you should have stopped me. You should have tried harder to keep someone like me. Who contributed so much to the company? The sheer audacity of his attempt to shift the blame made it clear that Miles had never really respected either the company or me. But no matter what he said, I had no intention of trying to keep him. Don't worry, you're already officially resigned. It seemed Miles finally realized that there wasn't even the slightest chance of being rehired. As he looked up at me, clinging desperately, I gave him one final push to move on. Besides, didn't you say your friend invited you to help start a new company? You should focus on that. For a moment, Miles looked confused, as if he didn't understand what I was saying. Then, as if remembering his own lie, he stood up shakily, his lips trembling. Ah, right, yes, I have a friend. Actually, we're just about to get serious about starting a company. Miles mumbled, his eyes unfocused, as he continued to ramble. He glanced at me one last time, his mouth twisting into a forced smile. Well, I guess it's good timing that I'm leaving. I'm going to join my friend's company, but you're really okay with that? From the way he was acting, it was clear that the story about his friend inviting him was a lie but I didn't press him on it. Instead, I just said, good luck at your new company, and watched as Miles left the office. He's a grown professional, after all. He should be able to take responsibility for his own words. Miles staggered down the hallway and left the company for good. None of the group members who had once rallied around him even bothered to show up or see him off. That alone was proof of Miles's lack of real influence or respect. In the end, there was no news of Miles starting a company with his friend. Instead, reports trickled in that he had been frequenting the employment office, trying desperately to find work. He went to several job interviews but was rejected each time. Apparently, he demanded executive-level treatment insisting he was a ready-made asset because of his prestigious university degree. As more companies turned him away, he eventually realized his attitude was the problem and accepted a more standard position. 
only to leave again after trying to negotiate with another resignation threat just six months later. Now, he's said to be living in shabby conditions, blowing his money from part-time jobs on gambling. Meanwhile, after Miles left, the company secured an even larger deal from the project I landed, resulting in a major contract that is expected to ensure our stability for the next 10 years. Thanks to that achievement, I'm now set to be promoted to division director. But what brings me the most joy is the positive atmosphere that has returned to the workplace. Instead of criticizing each other, we work together, always striving to do better. With this spirit, we continue to push forward, energized and productive. One of the most surprising and touching moments came when the young employee who had quit because of Miles returned. Apparently, he had been contacted by his former colleagues, who informed him that Miles was gone. When he reached out to me, asking humbly to be rehired, I was so moved that I had tears in my eyes. Today, he has grown into a reliable, senior employee who helps lead the company. I'm grateful we didn't lose such a talented worker. No matter how short-staffed we are, it's important to be careful about who we choose to work with. After all, work isn't something you accomplish alone, it's built through cooperation with your team. Moving forward, I'll continue to protect this positive work environment and make sure I recognize what truly matters. All of this is to make choices that leave no room for regret. With that resolve, I stepped into the office again today, ready for the day ahead.